I'm going to start a, I was going to try to get it all done in one uh, sermon, but I think we're going to have to have at least two. And so I've given, this is just part one right here. And this is something I've actually looked forward to talking about for a long time. And uh, probably I want to do like even like a write up a blog post or something like that because there's a lot of great, great thoughts and great material that I think is much needed in our society today in regards to ministering to the elder, ministering to the elderly. Uh, So uh, you got your little handout right there. And maybe you've noticed, uh, just real quick, just testimony growing up. I did, you know, my dad was in the military. We traveled around a lot, went to Japan twice and lived in various places. And, uh, you know, you grow, if you grow up in public school, um, supposing most everybody in here grew up in public school, public school, you really don't learn how to uh, maybe interact with a lot of older people. You pretty much stick with people your age. In fact, not only people in your age, but only people that are interested in the things that you're interested in. You know, <laughs> if you were the you know, the skater, maybe you didn't know how to, how to talk to, uh, you know, the, the rapper crowd or something like that. Do you all ha- agree with that? Was that ever like that in your school? Like you just dealt with the age group that you're in, which is funny because when we had children and decided to homeschool them, everybody said, oh, how are they going to be socially, you know, able to talk to other kids and interact with other kids? And I found out, actually, if you look around, most kids in our society today, they don't really have very many social skills. <laughs> they don't really know how to talk to anybody except those who speak their language. And they can speak, you know, the, the language of what they're interested in, maybe the gaming language or whatever culture that they're part of. And, uh, and if you take them in front of, like, you take them to a nursing home, they don't know how to talk to older people. <laughs> take them around different groups of people. Take them out soul winning with you, right? Get around this person, they freeze up, don't know how to talk to anybody. Uh, so really, if you think about it, public schools, they're not really helping, you know, in social development. In fact, part, part of the time, I think it's a problem too, because kids are so intimidated by the other kids, right? That you get them all in, the, in a big group and they try to act like, you know, that they're cool and try to fit in with everybody. And uh, what I've found with our kids is, uh, you know, obviously, I was just reading on a group, a Facebook group uh, page uh, just recently where there's a lot of homeschoolers and they're saying, what do you do like to make sure your kids have friends? And everybody else started saying, man, we got the same issue. We got the same issue. We're in the same boat with our kids. You know, they came here uh, t- when, they moved, when we moved to Iola, small town. You know, they gave up any chance they had of having a lot of good godly friends you know, in, uh, in Oklahoma City where we're in a larger church. But you know what I found out? A lot of times, even in the churches, when they got around a lot of other kids their age, and those kids were influenced by public school and stuff like that, a lot of those kids, did, it didn't end up good for them. You know, they might have grown up in a good home, maybe gone, you know, homeschooled, and they grew up with good values and everything, but then they started hanging out with friends, and the friends were a bad influence. Now, I'm not against having friends. I think that's good. <laughs> Wish that you can learn a lot, you know, by having a good friend and all that stuff. And God will provide that in a person's life. God will give friends, you know, children, don't get discouraged. Why don't I have any friends? God's going to provide you with the right set of friends. But here's what you don't want to do is get to the point where you're in this little clique and that's all you do is talk to that group of people. And one thing I was glad to see with my kids, they spent a a lot of time learning how to talk to their grandparents, learning how to talk to the older folks in our church, They go to the nursing home every other week uh, when we go, so they know how to talk to them. And I look back thinking, man, I wish I had that to some degree whenever I was younger, because growing up, getting into the ministry, this was like the last group of people I ever thought about, is the elderly. When when I went to Bible uh, college, you had to get involved in the school that you were, I mean, in the church that you were going to. And uh, you had to sign up for certain ministries. I want to be part of these ministries. You had to re- say what ministries you'd like to be a part of. Most everybody wanted to be in the bus ministry or in the teen ministry or something like that. And, and uh, you know, I did go to the nursing home because I thought it would be a good opportunity to preach. So I signed up for a nursing home ministry where I would preach. And like once a month or something, I would go there. I didn't really interact with the people because I didn't know how to. I just tried to get over the nerves and just preach in front of them, right? But that was like the extent of it. And I did a couple other things. Uh, we actually did end up working on the bus ministry. And, uh, the, but the last people I actually wanted to actually deal with, or not necessarily want to, but 
thought about dealing with would have been the, the elderly. And so when we ended up coming to Iola, and I worked several years as a youth pastor, so we dealt with youth. And having worked in the bus ministry, I knew how to deal with little kids, and so I was dealing with kids, dealing with youth. Did that for about eight years. And when I became the pastor, what a huge switch, because we had pretty much lost, in many ways, any kind of a youth ministry, which was actually good. I think the Lord was preparing us for where we are today. And, uh, and I had to go straight into working with 60, 70, 80, even 90-year-olds, and I didn't know how to do that. And, uh, and as I look around, I mean, I, I was trying to give it my best, but if I'm honest, I didn't know how to do that. I, I remember thinking about this one, one time uh, watching Brother Collins when I was the assistant pastor, and we were talking to uh, Brother Webb. He was trying to sign up for something in the back. And he was in his 90s already, and his hand was shaking really bad, and he was trying to fill something out, and he couldn't shake it. And Brother Collins was like, hey, can I f fill that out for you? And he took the pen from him and filled it out for him. And I'm thinking, I just sat there and watched his hand shake that whole time, didn't even think about asking, can I help, right? Because I just didn't know. I hadn't learned how to deal with older folks. And here's the thing about our society. It seems like we're getting to a point, if you haven't noticed, it seems very obvious to me anyway, that we're getting to a point where the elderly are often seen as somebody who is a burden to us and a burden to society and a burden to whatever it is and a hindrance uh, that actually they won't maybe flat out say this, but it's almost like somebody that they need to eliminate. We need to get rid of the older people. They're hindering us. They're slowing us down. And nobody wants to say that, but if you look at our society, that seems to be the attitude they have. So your first blank there is burden. Oftentimes our society sees the elderly as a burden and a hindrance and they need to find a way to eliminate. You know, the thing that disgusts me the most, disgusts me the most, is when I see younger people like actually talking about when their parents or their grandparents or whatever die and they got some inheritance coming to them or something and they're acting like they're looking forward to it. And it just makes me so sick to see that because I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, is that all that person means to you? It's just like, you know, I just want to get something from them. If they would just hurry up and die, you know, they might not come right out and say that, but that's kind of the, the, the way that they act. You know, even in churches, sometimes it's like, well, you know, if that person would just die, you know, and leave their, uh, what they have coming to the church in the will or something like that, you know, it's, and it's, it's unfortunate. But that's the way sometimes our elderly folks are treated. And so uh, the worst example of this is euthanasia, euthanasia. And that might sound like, you know what, that doesn't really go on. That goes on a lot more than you think it does. And I'm not talking about Dr. Kevorkian type, like, you know, let me just go pay a guy to kill my, uh, my grandpa or something like that. But euthanasia, in essence, now anyone that's had to put grandparents or parents into a nursing home, I'm not saying this always happens. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not accusing anybody of anything. But in a manner of speaking, oftentimes when somebody puts somebody into a nursing home, it's like their last, you know, it's like, let's just get, get them there, get them out of our life. You know, we know that, you know, they only got a short time to live, so they'll get there, you know. And oftentimes, if there's any sickness involved, they start giving them morphine. They start giving them all these things and just trying to slowly, let's just comfort them until they die. Now, look, I know there's a time for that. There's a time for that when they really are older and they're really just, they, they are in severe pain. They're hurting all the time. I understand. Let's just keep them comfortable until they die. But one of the things that bothers me is to watch people act like, yeah, they've already lived 70, 80 years. <laughs> you know, let's just, let them, let's just let them go on. And believe it or not, there are still those who, in a, in a manner of speaking, practice euthanasia, which is basically just trying to help older people die so that they can just move on. <laughs> I'm not really into politics and the laws and all that, so I, I can't speak from experience or anything, but the little bit that I hear... It seems also, uh, and I was just talking to somebody about this recently, who is on medical, uh, on government aid. And they have to get assistance from the government because of a health, health problem they have. And they said the unfortunate thing is younger people, it's getting easier and easier for them to get government assistance. And it's actually getting harder on a lot of the elderly people. It's getting harder for them. The, the government doesn't want to deal with them. They eat up a lot of the money, you know, with all their, their medication and all the sicknesses that they have. And the government doesn't want to help them anymore. And uh, to, to some degree, it seems like. And that's unfortunate. All right. Businesses are targeting younger people 
in seeing the elderly as a hindrance to their business. I remember I used to watch, we used to watch, watch different shows uh, that have to do with cooking or whatever. And one show we watched was where the guy would go in to a restaurant that was failing, you know, it was going under. And they would try to turn that around and try to get them some business and show them how. It was kind of neat learning to see how, you know, some of the things that they implemented to get the business growing again. But I remember one particular episode where there were older folks were pretty much the regulars at this restaurant. And, but, but it wasn't enough to bring in the business. But that, that was like the core group. And, you know, they had to do things a certain way. They had to keep certain things on the menu. If they changed decorations, the older people would complain. And so finally, this guy that came in to try to flip that business said, hey, you're going to have to stop catering to these older people. Otherwise, your business is going to die. You need to find ways to bring in the young people. And if the older people get mad, let them get mad. Okay? You have to keep your business alive. You have to keep these older people. I mean, you have to keep these younger people happy and get them in there. They're the future of your business. Now, let me tell you this from a business standpoint, that makes sense. And I have to say it's true. And I can agree with that. If you want to get ahead, you know, you can't, it's going to be really hard to just cater to a small group of older folks, you know, when you've got all these younger folks that just don't even want to come to your business anymore. Your business probably isn't going to make it. But here's the question I want to ask these might be unfortunate realities in the business world, but is it biblical for us to have the same mentality? in our churches how many of you guys heard about that methodist church apparently it made a lot got a lot of media attention i actually had already started this i already knew i was going to teach this and uh had some of the some of the thoughts already going into this before i ever heard this but apparently there's a methodist church i think it's in yeah it's in minnesota in the twin cities area and uh and what happened is they actually have two locations one location is seeing a lot of growth a lot of young kids are coming in there. And I would suspect from the way I hear it, it's more of the contemporary style services. The other location that they have is just maybe 20 older folks, not, no growth, no younger folks coming in. Sound familiar? <laughs> Sounds a lot like Iola, right? And, uh, and a lot of independent Baptist churches today, by the way. And this Methodist church said, you know what? We need to do something. This church will not make it. And all the books out there, the church guru books, will tell you, you know, that's not going to happen. If your average population is 70 years old, you're dead. That church is going to die. You just give it a little bit of time. It's not going to make it. That's what they say. And so all these church building conferences and stuff you go to, places that tell you how to build your church, uh, they're going to tell you, hey, you got to cater to the younger people. you got to bring them in there. That's the life of the church. That's where it's going to grow and everything. And so, uh, so what this church did is they said, here's what we're going to do. Now, again, I'm sure media likes to twist this stuff, so I haven't spoken to the pastor. I don't know all the, uh, all the ex exact details about what's going on. But I did read an article that was trying to explain, like, I know it sounds really bad what they're doing. Uh, you know, everybody's spinning that to be a real bad thing. But they said, let me explain what's really going on. In the article that I read, I think it's Slate. I don't even know what that is, but it's like Slate or something like that. Certainly wasn't a Christian uh, leaning, <laughs> you know, or it didn't seem like it to me anyway. And, uh, and they were saying, here are the details of what's really going on. Right? They had interviewed the pastor and stuff like that. And, and the pastor said, well, you know, this is just, we just got to save this. We got to save this, minute, this church from, from dying. And so we're just trying to come up with new ideas. And, and we want them to be able to get involved in everything. We want them to be here. But the younger people aren't going to come in if we keep doing the same things we've always done. So here was the recommendation. Here's what they put into place. As far as I know, they, they went through with it. They said, we're going to basically shut everything down and start from scratch and we're going to start with the you know appealing to the younger crowd and we don't even want our older population to come back for like 18 months i mean like over over a year they're basically kicked out of their church and they said if you want to be a part of the church after that you're welcome back but we want to have a year a year or 18 months or whatever to build this thing up and get healthy growth and I just can't believe that anybody could even look at that and say, well, yeah, that sounds like a reasonable idea. Now, maybe if you're a restaurant, 
Maybe if you're selling uh, some kind of product and you don't really care so much about, you know, hey, we just need to find out what our demographic is and go after that group and forget about, you know, whoever's already there. But the question I want to bring up is what does the Bible actually say about our elderly, you know? Oftentimes, the Bible says the word elder, and we think of it as uh, pastor, right? Elders, bishops, uh, 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 pastors, same thing. I believe that each of those talks about a different aspect of what the minister's job, that preacher's job is. So, you know, you got the elder kind of speaks to the fact of maturity and being able to lead them in that kind of way. The pastor, you think of, of uh, that means like shepherd, and so it speaks to the uh, the responsibility he has to feed them and take care of them, protect them and all that. And then the bishop has to do with, uh, uh, you know, kind of overseeing and caring for, tending to. Uh, and all of those are kind of similar. But sometimes when the Bible says elder, you know, it's talking about the aged, right? And so there's at least an implication there. So we just read First Timothy 5, and what a great passage there. But we're going to learn uh, some things from or just. Uh, consider some things from this chapter again, a little closer detail. Let's read verse 1 through 3 again. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. Now, let's just say that's only talking about pastors, okay? Let's just give it that. I don't think it is. I think it's just talking about elder men, right? But let's say that's talking about pastors. Let's keep reading. But entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, and the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity, don't you kind of see that that's just talking about the, those who make up the church? Though, those who are elder, treat them like a father or a mother. Or if they're age appropriately, treat them as a grandmother or a grandfather. And the younger ladies, you treat them as a sister, right? In all purity, not trying to flirt with them or, you know, whatever, but just to treat them like they're your sister, right? Unless, they're, unless you're married to them, then, you know, not like a sister, but, you know. But you understand this idea that the church is kind of like a family, right? Even Jesus himself said, you know, these are my brothers and my sisters and my mothers. And, and, uh, and, and he's talking about that. So the elderly are our parents and our grandparents, right? That's your blanks there, your parents and your grandparents. In essence, you know, I, again, dad being in the military, not spending a lot of time around my grandparents, Still love them. We still visited and cared about them whenever we got to see them. But I didn't spend a whole lot of time around them. Like my kids are getting to see their grandparents a little bit more uh, to, to some degree. And, uh, and I didn't really get that, that privilege necessarily. But you know what? I've noticed all the churches I've been in, I've got a bunch of moms. I've got a bunch of grandmas. <laughs> you know, I've got a bunch of, of dads and grandpas. And, uh, and so really that's the way the church is supposed to work. Look at Leviticus 19 now. And hold your place in 1 Timothy, if you would. Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19 and 20. Some pretty rough uh, chapters in the Bible, right? I'm talking about from a world's standpoint. Chapter 19, look at verse 32. Here's a great passage. <clears throat> Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. You get this idea that when an aged person with a, with a grayish, whitish hair, you know, they, speaks to the, the age and the wrinkles in their face and all that, and you realize, hey, this person's been around a long time. Well, what would you do in your own house? You know, grandpa comes into the room. And he's walking like this. Everybody get up. Hey, Grandpa, why don't you sit here? Right? I remember taking uh, Brother Art Collins before he passed away. He really liked baseball. And there was a guy coming to our church at the time who uh, played for the uh, Allen County, uh, what, what's their baseball team? I think their name's actually the Devils, Red Devils or something. Like that. And they, why all these colleges want to call their mascot the Devils? I could think of a few reasons. But anyway, so... Uh, and he's, this kid was coming to our church, and he was bringing friends in, uh, to church with him, and great guy. And he was like a, a all-star on the baseball team. And so Brother Collins uh, had heard that he had a game coming up. And brother, I'm talking about Brother the brother Collins. You guys probably met. It's his dad, Brother A.F. Collins. And uh, 
And he was this guy had a deep voice, you know, and he just had this look on him, like, like that kind of demanded some respect, you know. But he'd wear his little top hat and his overcoat, and he's like, I think I want to go to that game. And I told him I would take him to that. And whenever we came, I'm walking him over to the bleachers, you know, and he's uh, uh, kind of out of breath. And he's, uh, uh, and I'm telling you, everybody got off those bleachers, like all the spectators, and they're trying to help him. And, you know, hey, you can have this seat. Hey, you got to, and it was just neat to watch. So people just respect him, right? Maybe because they assumed, hey, this guy must be somebody. He's got a suit on or whatever. I don't think so. I think it was just like this is a guy who is, is wearing his age well. Does that make sense? Interesting thought. If a lady is ladylike, guess what men do? They usually treat them like a lady. They're more gentlemen, you know, around them because they look like ladies. Uh, and so you just you just wear your position. I love how the Bible talks about uh, Titus does this and Timothy a little bit, and and they say, hey, these teach. This is what you need to teach that the aged women be like this, the aged men be like this, the younger ladies be like that. Look, we all got a position in our life that we need to. To play in the elderly folks should be allowed to be old <laughs> it shouldn't be and, and and here's the thing right now I remember when I was a kid like 60 and 70 year olds which are now like the 80s and 90s or I mean depending on how, how far back you go right and I remember thinking like the elderly that the elderly folks were like uh, you know respected like you always want to be respectful to them now you get to the age 60, those who are about age 60 right now, a lot of those are the ones that are like, you know, the guy's got ponytails and they're like, you know, don't call me, sir, I'm Bob, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and it's just like, it, it kind of lost that, right? But there's still a generation out there and some even from that thing that, that they have embraced their age and, uh, and they've accepted the fact that they're elder and they, and hey, we, it's all right to treat them like, like they're our elders. Right? Treat them like your grandpa. So here are some, uh, we're just going through introductory remarks here. Uh, one is, like I said, the elderly are our parents, our grandparents. And then the second thing is this, we should honor our elders as such. And then a couple of disclaimers here. This doesn't imply that there aren't evil people out there who are elderly. Right? Don't ever think just because someone's old, man, oh, well, that person, you know, we, <laughs> we can trust them with, it, with everything. No, uh, there are somebody that we might consider to be elderly. There are wicked people out there that are old, okay? Every generation since the beginning of time has had uh, evil people in this world. So you don't trust somebody or just let your guard down because they're older. And it doesn't mean that the elderly are never to be rebuked or corrected. There's a time to do that. I think there's, there's a way to do that respectfully, but that there are times when an elder needs to be rebuked and corrected. But here's what I'm saying about honoring the elders. It means that we are to honor their position in life. And here's the main thing I think. This is hum humility on our part, okay? Recognizing that they have lived a life that we have not yet lived, okay? Uh, you think about the young teenagers, right, who act like they've already got the answers to everything, and you're like, you've never been an adult yet. Why do you think you know what it's like to be an adult? You've never been an adult yet. And, uh, and so a guy in 30s, 40s, you know, looking at the elderly, look, man, we haven't been there yet. I'll get up there sometimes in the pulpit in Iola, and I'll say something about, man, I feel like I'm getting old, and they'll just all start laughing, like, ah, you don't even know <laughs> what it's like to be old. You know, you don't even know. And, uh, and so we have to honor their, uh, their position in life, okay? Now, we know Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 kind of quotes uh, the commandments of Exodus 20, uh, the Ten Commandments, and it says that we're to honor our mother and father, right? Uh, honor thy mother and thy father that thy days may, be that days may be long upon the earth, right? So honor and obey are your blanks right there. We know that children are supposed to honor and obey their parents. Everybody with young kids, you've taught their kids that verse, right? Your kids already know that verse. <laughs> obey your mother and father, right? We teach them that. We know that's true. Hey, kids are supposed to honor their mother and father, right? But if that's true, that the kids are supposed to honor, obey their father, if we're supposed to do that when we're children living at their home, why should we stop honoring them 
at a time in their life when they need us most. So you got parents. Uh, now, again, I know there are bad ones out there. I know there are grandparents out there. Now, look, we're also in a day and age where I've noticed a lot of grandparents raising their grandkids. How many of you guys have seen that happen a lot? And you're like putting two together, and two and two together in your mind, and you're thinking, something happened, you know, with their children. What happened with that generation? And now they're raising their grandchildren, and you're like, well, what happened to the parents, you know? A lot of times it's a bad situation, drugs or something, and, uh, and, it, and it's an awful situation. So we know that there are times that they made mistakes and things aren't going so well, but now they're raising their grandchildren and, it's, and it seems like a, a, a terrible position for them to be in. But here's the fact of the matter. They did spend all that time raising the kids and supporting the kids, taking care of them, trying to give them, even though they made mistakes, trying to give them all that they could. And then they get to an age, right? You're finally growing up. You're ready to get out of the house. And then it's like, now I need to make a life for my, my own self. And then just forget about that, those people that did so much for you. And now all of a sudden they can't take care of themselves like they used to. And their health is starting to fail. And they're going, you know, you know worse and worse on their health and everything. And oftentimes our society just says, oh, well, that's too, too bad for them, right? And disrespects their, uh, the fact that they've given so much. Back to 1 Timothy 5. 1 Timothy 5, look at verse 4. <clears throat> now, this is specifically talking about the widows. And uh, it almost seems, I remember I used to read this and think, man, that seems really rough on the widows. Like, if they're widows, they lost their husband, shouldn't we just take care of them? But it gives very specific uh, uh, commands as, in regards to what, the, what makes a widow a true widow that needs help of the church. Honor widows that are widow indeed, right? Verse 4, but if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Look at verse 8. I think it's 8, yeah. But if any provide not for his own, and, specific, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Interesting if you read what the context is talking about, right? Often we think about, man, you got to take care of your wife, you got to take care of your kids. Well, duh, we know that. But what about somebody that won't even take care of their own grandparents or their own mother or father whenever they have opportunity? Or even an aunt, in this case, right? An aunt or an uncle can't take care of themselves and they're, and they're elderly. Uh, and, the, you know, if they would go to a church for help, before going to their own family member, there's something wrong there. There's something sad. We get knocks on the door of the church all the time and phone calls all the time where they're asking for money. And I ask, like, so you don't have any family that could help you out? They're like, no, they don't want anything to do with me. And I'm thinking, don't you think something's probably wrong? <laughs> right? We should be able to keep that communication with our parents and our grandparents and take care of them and, and, uh, and, and be able to to give back a little bit of what they've given to us for so long. Now, obviously, this doesn't mean, and this is important to consider, look at Luke chapter 9, obviously this doesn't mean that we're supposed to go get so caught up on caring for our family members, uh, the, every family member that has problems, and every you, they get a little bit older, well, now you're moving in us, and we're moving in with us, and we're going to spend our whole lives taking care of you, and and you get to where you can't even fulfill the work that God's given you to do, that would be a problem. Luke 9, 57, I think is a good place. It talks about that. Luke 9, <clears throat> verse 57. And it came to pass, as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid them farewell which are at my home, at my uh, at home, at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, 
is fit for the kingdom of God. Someone might look at that and say, see, Jesus didn't care about anybody. He didn't care about his mother, his father. Uh, you know, of course, he didn't have an earthly father, but you know what I mean. He didn't care about his grandparents. He, man, he's just all about doing the work. Yeah, but you remember, like, even before he's hanging on the cross, what's he do? He, he, he gives his mother over to the care of John to take care. He still had care for his mother. He was still taking some responsibility to take care of his mother. And I would never say that anybody should just sacrifice the rest of their life you know, that's going to suffer, that their, their parent, I mean, their, their wives and their kids are going to suffer, and the ministry God called them to is going to suffer just because they got to give all their time to the elderly. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying we do have a responsibility. If there's anything in our power that we can do, we need to step it up and do something for the elderly. And if not, uh, our own family, certainly people in our church that could use our help who might be elder, and I think this is an important thing to discuss. So your last blank right there, I think, was disciples. Okay? Uh, everyone in our family, uh, we shouldn't be caught up in every, uh, caring for everybody in our family, that, so caught up that we don't accomplish anything for the Lord as his dedicated disciples. All right? If you're giving your life to the Lord and you're going to serve him, follow him with your life and do great things for him, it's going to cause some sacrifices and th some things you have to give up. So that's not what we're talking about. But we do want to honor and respect our parents and grandparents. All right. Now, let me just point this. As we're talking about these introductory thoughts, there's a huge spectrum among those who are 60, 70, 80, 90, right? I kid you not, I worked at an aid station at a, an ultra marathon. It was a 100-mile race. And I wasn't running in it. I was just helping at aid stations as people came by. I was paying paying my way, my entry fee into another race by sitting there and <laughs> helping at this aid station. And I was at mile, it would have been like mile 20, I think. And uh, no, that wouldn't be right. I can't remember, but they had to pass us at the beginning of the race, first, first quarter of the race. And then the last quarter of the race, they had to come by. And at the very beginning, man, everybody's flying. And you're just like, man, they all look like they're in pretty good shape. And there was this lady that she was 63. 63 the day that they were having this race. I think she, that was her birthday. And she flew back by. I think she was third place. And I thought, man, that's amazing. That's amazing. How many 63-year-olds do you know at the top? And I'm not talking about like, oh, yeah, well, they're all just like speed walking or hiking because it's 100 miles. No, these people were running this 100-mile race faster than I can run a marathon. I mean, they were, they were flying. And this lady was 63, and she was keeping up with the top guys. And so there was a guy, I think in his 40s, that ended up finishing the race. Because, by the way, when they came back through at nighttime, she's still in the same position, right up there at four, uh, either number th third place or fourth place. And she ended up finishing that race, a 63-year-old woman, like fourth overall. There was like a 40-year-old, uh, I think, that actually won the race, which was, you know, he was, he was amazing too. And then there was a couple like in their 30s. Uh, and then you had fourth place was this lady, 63 years old. I looked down the, the, the whole race. There were people in their 60s, 70s. I've been in races where there are people in their 80s. I don't think there were in that race. Literally in their 80s for like a 50-mile race. They're real slow, but <laughs> they're in there. But here's the thing. I know some 40- and 50-year-olds who are in such bad health they could never do that. And I know some 70-year-olds who are in such bad health that there are 80 year olds that can do more than they can do right but then i know some 80 year olds who are so sharp in their mind and they've got physical strength and they can run up and down stairs and they can do everything and crawl on their knees and do all that and so you understand there's a huge spectrum when i talk about the elderly and caring for the elderly we're not going to get into a lot in this lesson but late excuse me later we're going to talk about some of the more details about actually ministering to them caring for them look some 70 and 80 year olds, they require less help. They can do things for themselves. And honestly, to some degree, you should let them do things for themselves because it keeps them healthy and, and it keeps them strong and working. But, but uh, there's a huge spectrum right there in regards to their health and their quality of life. All right. I believe that we should be striving. This is a, a reminder because, look, none of us in here are elderly. Right. Uh, you might look at my wife and me and say, well, you guys are getting there, but we're not. Nobody in here is elderly. Trust me. I work with elderly folks and nobody in here is elderly. OK, but 
here's something we ought to realize. One day we're going to be old, elderly. I don't know what the proper word is. <laughs> One day we're going to be aged. And so we ought to start thinking about that now in the decisions that we make in life, right? And, and our health. And, uh, you know, I've already decided, like, I don't want this to be it. And everything from here is downhill. <laughs> I need to get healthy and I need to get, realize that I want to be one of those people in their 70s and 80s who are sharp and are still able to get around and not requiring a lot of assistance from other people. And, uh, and so it's important to do that. Not everybody has been able to do that, but, man, you find some folks. And I don't know, it seems like the ones that grew up on a farm, you know. You deal with them and you're just like, that person can, you know, they can work harder than me <laughs> in their 70s, 80s, year, 80 year old. And, uh, and I don't know so much that it is that their body's uh, physically that strong. They just learn how to deal with it and not complain about it, you know. And, and also, anyway, there's a huge spectrum. There's no doubt about that. All right, so this is not good. Let, look at your second page, and someone tell me if they've got, this is the second time I've done this, if they've got the blanks filled in already on the second page. Look at those extras, Zachary. I somehow stapled the first page has blanks filled in and the second page does, uh, has only blanks. I think I could get through it, but if you got, if your page has uh, words, you have the words on it? Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Yes, that's it. Here, I'll switch you. There <laughs> you go. Sorry, that's embarrassing, man, but that would have been interesting for me to try to get through with that. All right, here we go. So here's what we want to know. We want to know the extent of our responsibilities in regards to ministering to the elderly in our churches, right? And how do we accomplish those responsibilities? Do we have a responsibility? Should we take care of it? I think we already established that, that we should. And, uh, and I want to talk more detail. I want to provide some practical and biblical advice that will help us to do these three things. Now, today we're only going to talk about the first one. And that is to evangelize the elderly. You're going to meet lost folks out there and uh, that are older, and uh, you already have knocking doors. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Then we will talk about caring for shut-ins. That's people who can't get out, can't come to church, um, and sometimes in even bedridden or whatever. Uh, that'll we'll cover this in another lesson. And then ministering to our faithful members who attend. Uh, at the church okay now you know you've been to Iola it's interesting okay we've got a ma the majority of our people that's not that's not a surprise there's a lot of independent Baptist churches that are full of older older folks but what's weird is we've tried to go after reaching a younger group you know bring some families in and stuff like that and it's like the Lord has allowed us to now we've seen more and more come in but they're also older folks the other day, on, on, uh, we were knocking doors in, in Iola, and I knocked on, it's not just right down the street from the church. We, we started all over again on our map, you know, and we start right there by the church, and then we go around the city. And we went into, uh, uh, right down, down there by the church, I knocked on the door. This lady came out. She's in her 80s. I think 86, is that what I told you? I think she said she's 86, something like that. And, uh, and I gave her the gospel, and... Quite honestly, she wasn't 100% sure she was going to heaven. Afterwards, she said she understood everything that I said, and she believed that, and uh, kind of got distracted. We started talking about something else, and so she never did pray. But uh, we're going to go back, Lord willing, we get her to come on Sunday, and we're going to go back. She said that, uh, you know, she understood what I said. You know, she confessed that she believed that and all. Uh, but uh, it was an interesting because I thought, I'm l looking at this lady, and I'm thinking, this lady needs to come to our church. Like she was made to go to our church. The people at our church would love her. And she would love the people at our church. As I'm talking to her, I'm like, it's a, it's a fit, right? And I realized between that and we've got some members that we've got in Iola from starting the nursing home ministry. And I go in the nursing home ministry. And this Tuesday, uh, we, we were in the nursing home. And at first there was like nobody there. And so... Uh, you know, usually they start rounding everybody up for us, and I thought, man, it's going to be low attendance today. Ended up having a pretty good uh, amount of folks there, and I started talking about usually, you know, 
Uh, I've got a certain way about doing that, which we'll talk about that in another day. But I've got a certain way about trying to minister to these folks. But this time, uh, and I always talk a little bit about the gospel, if for, nothing, if, if for no other reason, for all the workers who are walking in and out and bringing medicine and all that, and I want them to hear it, so I, don't, I try not to hold back on that. But this time I was given a very clear plan of salvation. And we were just talking about prayer, and then I got to talking about how, uh, you know, this is how you even call upon the Lord, right? You know, and I explained salvation, I believe. And all these folks are really tuned in. And so I did the first time I've ever done this, I believe, at that, at that nursing home. We've talked to people individually about their salvation, but this time I said, would you do me a favor? I said, you've been watching me. I've told you how to know for sure you're going to heaven. Would you raise your hand if you know for sure you're going to heaven so I can see who does? The majority of them raised their hand, which doesn't mean anything. I understand that. But I wanted to get an idea which ones kept their hand down because they didn't know, so we can go personally talk to them. And so it's like I feel like the Lord has put me in an opportunity where, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow you to keep working with older people. And you think, hey, the only way to grow this church and to see results for God is bringing in young people and doing all that. I'll show you different. <laughs> I'm going to keep the older people coming in, and you're going to keep ministering to the older folks. And I told them when I first took over that church, look, you're looking around, and you're thinking, hey, this church is dying. Hardly anybody left. Uh, any, rem uh, any semblance of, of younger people that we have, they left and went to another church before I even became the pastor. And so you look around, and you think, hey, we're going to die. What are we going to do? And I told him a long time ago, I said, hey, I think of it like Gideon, you know. He's, he's taken us down to where a point where we can say, when the Lord does something great among this church, we can say, I didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> it was all God, right? And so sometimes you think, well, they're older, they're feeble, they're not going to do anything. That's the end of this church. Well, we leave that in God's hand, right? And, and, and an amazing thing, my desire to see young people who are passionate for the Lord and want to knock on doors and want to see souls saved, guess what? God still allowed me to have that. <laughs> I'm still working with you guys. And the people in Iowa love it. They love to hear the stories about us knocking on doors. They love to see you guys and, and to know that something great's going out in the big city. Uh, you know, and it makes, motivates them. And they start trying to do more. And we've got some that come uh, door knocking with us and they pray and they do all that. And so, so look, God is good. You know, it's not about what can we do to make, you know, more people come in here. What can we do? What kind of program? How can we, you know, appeal to the younger generation? Well, maybe you don't want them yet. Maybe let's get some, some of these older folks straightened out and lined up, you know, and fervent, you know, kindle the fire, right, so that they get back in tune with the, with the Lord. And then we can start bringing younger people in and teach those younger people to respect the, el the elderly and, uh, and all that. So let's talk real quick. If I got time, let me see where we are. Let's talk real quickly about uh, evangelizing the lost. We're not going to get farther than that, but let's just share a few thoughts on this. Most of this is just practical, so we're not going to look at a lot of scripture, but the, f the main way that we, we do evangelism is door knocking, okay? We, you all understand that. So what do you do when you knock on a door and an elderly lady or an elderly man comes to the door? Here's some thoughts. Number one, be respectful. Now, you would think that that's just a, we should be respectful with everybody, right? <laughs> and that's true, but you got to understand, we live in different times now. We live in times where this generation doesn't necessarily expect you to be respectful. They don't necessarily expect you to have manners and all that. But if you knock on an older person's door, they're probably going to expect that from you. And if you're not being uh, polite and courteous uh, to them, they don't wanna, they're not going to listen to what you have to say. They just say that guy was rude. Now, incidentally, they're going to be rude to you probably. <laughs> a lot of older folks, uh, they just come across as very rude, right? Let them be rude, okay? Just be respectful to them. You're trying to give them the gospel. Again, I know this is true for any age, age group, but I'm talking specifically about the elderly. Just be respectful. My, uh, smile and be formal with your speech. You know, there's no reason to, and this goes back to what I said about growing up in public schools and, and you know, listening to uh, the, today's music and watching movies, you know, that are age specific, whatever, is we've raised a generation that doesn't know how to talk to the older folks. And, uh, and, and if you're going to talk to an older folk, there's no reason to use slang. 
You know, there's no reason to use, you're like, well, that's the only way I know how to talk. Well, yeah, try to step it up a little bit for the <laughs> older folks, right? Go ahead and say, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. Even if they, did, oh, you don't have to call me that, they're going to appreciate it because they come from a generation where that was, an, that was a sign that you're showing respect and that you care about them. You know, may I take a minute to show you the gospel, you know, may I, and then thank them for things, all right? Here, B, here's some, a good tip. It's something I had to work on when I became the pastor, and I'm still working on it. Speak loudly and clearly. I don't have one of those voices. I need a microphone, you know, if I'm going to speak in the loud in a, in a big congregation. And I found out what, what I do a lot is my voice. And I, just the other day in Sunday school, one of the ladies said, I can't hear what you're saying. She wasn't being rude. I mean, it seems like, hey, lady's supposed to be quiet in church, right? She's just trying to let me know I can't understand you. And what was happening is I'd be loud like I am, you know, this is me being loud, okay? I'd be <laughs> loud like this, but then at the end of my sentence, maybe you've noticed I do this, my, I started mumbling and trailing off a little bit. So they weren't hearing what I was saying at the end of my speech. So I have to constantly remember, be loud and be clear because you want them to understand everything that you're saying. You don't worry about, hey, the, the, you know, the neighbors are all looking at me to see who this guy is on the door. Who cares, all right? You're interested in that person that's at the door. Speak loudly and clearly. Here's something uh, that, to remember while you're there talking to them, especially if they look like somebody's all alone and they could use help or whatever, and you notice something needs to be done, something that you can do, uh, ask them if you can help them with anything. I keep talking, I think I shared this once before, and I keep talking about it, and I kick myself every time I think about it. I wish I could I go back in time and fix this, man. But <laughs> we knocked on a door, and a lady came out. This is in... Uh, I think this is when we were knocking doors in, uh, in uh, Humboldt, yeah. And this lady came out, probably in her 90s, and she had glasses on, and there's something on her glasses that looked like she had fallen asleep in ice cream or something, or mashed potatoes or something like that. And she's at the door, she's talking to me, she's got this big glob of something on her glasses. And I'm like trying to talk to her with a straight face, right, and I'm trying not to stare at the, the big glob of something on her glasses. And after we left, I don't remember which one of you guys with me, Braden or Zachary. After we left, I was like, man, I should have asked her if I could clean her glasses for her. She probably didn't even really completely see it and know what was going on, but how thoughtful it would have been. For you think, well, no, that'd be disrespectful. That'd be rude. No, you know, most older folks have gotten to a point in their life where they realize if someone doesn't help me, I'm not going to be able to do it, right? <clears throat> one of the, you know, just in the last six months, all right. The Lord has showed me some things. Uh, for the first time, I fed some uh, this. I'm showing you, I haven't really dealt with older people a whole lot. Right. I've only been the pastor there a year and a half and the Lord's slowly starting to teach me things. But one of our guys, Brother Webb, you know, he had to go into the nursing home and his mind's still pretty sharp, but physically he can't do things. And I went to visit him and he was waiting for one of the nurses to come feed him, but they weren't coming. And I was like, I was like, you want me to feed you? And in my mind, I'm thinking, I hope he says no, because I don't want to do that. I feel awkward about it. <laughs> but he's like, yeah, okay. And I was thinking, this is weird, man. I've never fed an old person before. I've fed babies. And I'm sitting there feeding them, and I'm, get, I'm making a mess. It's all down his face. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Let me get a napkin. And he's like, and it was just, it was awkward, okay? But you know what I thought? Man, why is that so awkward for me? <laughs> why don't I realize that this is a guy in need and uh, he's done so much in his lifetime, it's time for someone to take care of him. And he's learning now that, hey, I just can't get around it. I've got to let other people take care of me. Why can't I humble myself and take care of him? So even visiting somebody, you know, we tend to think, man, I got to knock on this door. I got to hurry up and get over this door so I can knock on the next door. Somebody down there might be waiting to get saved. I can't waste my time with this lady right there. You never know how the Lord could use you with that one individual. Just because they're elderly doesn't mean you can't reach them. It just means it might take a little bit more time. You might have to use a little bit different approach, but you might be able to do something for that person, even if they are saved or even if, you know, they don't get saved. You might have been able to help them and plant a seed, and they say, man, that was a nice young man from that, you know, that church over there or whatever. So ask them if you can do something to help them. <clears throat> I hate even sharing this one, okay? <laughs> Like the next week after helping that, uh, after feeding Brother Webb, and I'm thinking, man, that's, that was humbling for me. Like I've never done that. It felt, felt very weird. I mean, I'm embarrassed that, 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 that I feel that way about it, but that's the way I felt. 
And, uh, and so I had told this guy, I would give him, I would take him a, give him a ride, another guy in his 80s. And I said I would give him a ride to Wichita because he had an appointment and he couldn't find anyone to drive him. And he's handicapped, his wife's handicapped, and it's a long trip. And I said, sure, I'll take you there, no problem. And uh, it was it was tough, man. It was tough. Make sure you load them. Oh, first thing I get there, I shouldn't probably, I don't know. I don't probably don't have a lot of time. Bear with me just for a minute because this is dealing with older, older folks, all right? I first get there, and I don't want to be inappropriate or anything like that, but he hadn't got dressed yet. And I didn't know when I showed up to give him a ride, he didn't need someone to get him dressed too. So he just always used to it. Somebody comes and helps him and helps him get dressed. And today was my day to take care of him. So I get in there and he's kind of like, I need help getting dressed. And I'm thinking, can't you find someone else to do it? <laughs> can't you dress yourself, right? I'm thinking, but I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll help you. I just swallow my pride, swallow my pride. I help him get dressed. And then I'm like, okay, all right, that's the worst thing that can happen today. I help load him up in his vehicle, strap him in, strap the walker, you know, and I get in the driver's seat. We drive all the way to Wichita, and, uh, and that goes okay. I help him get out, help him get in to his appointment. He said afterwards, he said, I'm going to buy you a steak for taking me. And we went to uh, Outback Steakhouse, and he bought me a steak. But the problem was, I mean, I had to almost physically put him into the chair because he couldn't, he shouldn't fit in there, and his body's not working right. His arm, he's like ah ah ah, and I'm trying to help him get in there, and it was the mo it was the worst experience at a restaurant because everybody's watching, and he's like sliding out of his chair, and I got to go help him get in the chair, and I was like all right all right, right after we get him in the car, that's it man, it's not going to be any worse today, and he's like hey there's this gas station over there, best coffee. It was the worst coffee, but he said it was the best coffee you can get. It was nasty. <laughs> I don't even think I finished it, and you know how I drink coffee. <laughs> He's like, we need to stop there, and we need to get gas anyway, so I'll, I'll take you in there, and I'll get you some, uh, some coffee. And we stopped there. I helped him. He said he had to go to the bathroom, so I helped him go to the bathroom. I started talking to the lady in there. We pumped up gas and all that kind of stuff. Time goes by. A lot more time goes by, and I'm like, now what's going on in there? And all of a sudden, I start thinking in my mind like the worst possible scenario. And I'm like, no, surely it's not going to be anything like this. And I kid you not, I get a, I mean, like 20, 30 minutes goes by, and I get this holler, Rocky. And I'm like, oh, Lord, please no. You think about the worst possible thing right now in your mind <laughs> that you can think, and that's what it will look like. <laughs> Probably worse. <laughs> so I had to do the worst thing I've ever had to do. For an older person but you know what whenever I was done I was like you know what I'm not gonna say it wasn't bad all right it was bad <laughs> but I thought in my mind I said you know what this guy just know he had to humble himself because there was no way he could take care of it himself he had to humble himself ask somebody else to come in and help him I, I helped him I lived through it right and in my mind, I want to say, now, it can't get any worse than that, but it might. <laughs> okay, so you just don't ever say that. But here's what I said. That wasn't really that bad. I just helped somebody. You know, that gave them a greater respect for me that I was willing to do that. And I was, ha you know, I was happy to do that. And uh, I hesitated. But, yes, I was happy to do that. You know, in the end of the day, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I helped them. We got back home, you know, and I thought, with older people is you know and you say man I don't want to work with older people well guess what if you're in the ministry people are people 